Hello and welcome to Interactive Stargazing. My name is Ariel and I'm an educator at the Lowell Observatory. Uh, tonight we'll be showing you some really neat objects using our 14 inch plane wave telescope at our Giovale Open Deck Observatory. And later on in the stream, we will be talking about the Mars opposition. So uh, the first object that we'll be showing off today is M15 or the Pegasus Cluster. So M15 is a globular star cluster located in the constellation Pegasus, right off of the nose of Pegasus. Uh, <clears throat> it's uh, M15 means Messier 15, or it's the 15th object noted in French astronomer Charles Messier's catalog of 110 little smudges he saw in the sky. Uh, these smudges are now known to be objects like the Andromeda Galaxy or the Orion Nebula or the Pegasus Cluster. Now, what a globular star cluster is, is it's a group of hundreds of thousands of stars all bound together by gravity. Uh, these stars, or how a globular cluster is formed, is there will be a large uh, gas cloud called a nebula. So there's all of this, this molecular gas cloud. And over hundreds of thousands of years, uh, this gas will condense and compress and fuse through gravity. And this these uh, nebulae have enough gas and mass to form tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of little sun-like stars. Uh, now, these stars were formed so close together that there's a big enough gravitational pull for them to all sort of stay globbed together. So we can see uh, in this image here that our uh, plane wave is uh, projecting, uh, we see that center of gravity or center of mass in the center there. Uh, and uh, again, that group of hundreds of thousands of stars. And then as we get further and further away from that core, uh, that gravity gets less and less intense. So those stars are more kind of uh, spaced out. Now, <clears throat> uh, this object is about 33,000 light years away, meaning we're looking 33,000 years into the past. So all of that light traveling from those stars, about 670 million miles an hour, or 2.99 times 10 to the eight meters per second. Um, light years are just the craziest thing to me because one light year is six billion miles. Now, like a billion is a really big number, but starting with just like a million, you know, counting uh, to a million will take you about 11 days. Uh, counting to uh, one, oh gosh. Yeah, counting to a million <laughs> will take you about 11 days. Uh, and counting to a billion will take you about 32,000 years. Um, so, you know, billions is a big number and a light year is a very large distance. So in this globular cluster, uh, since this thing's about 12 billion years old, uh, we're seeing very, very old stars. This is one of the oldest globular clusters we know of. Uh, so, uh, these stars, I believe we may actually be able to, uh, if we adjust the focus time or exposure time, will we be able to get some red stars out of the cluster? So uh, what we're doing here is we're messing with our little uh, camera. We're messing with our Malin cam here by lowering the exposure and adjusting our settings down there, we might be able to get some of those cooler stars. Nice, yeah, so right in the center there, uh, we can see those cooler stars, those redder stars. So in space, red means cooler and white or blue means hotter. So in this glob we're seeing in that core there that uh, these are very, are very cool as in like only a couple thousand degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, very cool, very old stars. So with that, how about we jump on over to another object, uh, M15, just or that guy right there, the globulars M15. Uh, so M57 is the 57th object cataloged in Messier's catalog. Uh, the Ring Nebula is one of my favorite things to look at. I just think he's really cool. Uh, it's a planetary nebula in the constellation Lyra. Oh, he looks so nice. Oh. Oh, so uh, what a planetary nebula is, uh, the name is a bit misleading. There's no real planets involved. So way back when uh, an English astronomer or European astronomer, William Herschel, when he was first looking at these objects, he saw this cloud of gas. So he called it a nebula. And then in the center of this cloud of gas, he saw a dot. And he's like, he said it looked somewhat Jupiter-like. So he thought that there was a planet inside of this cloud of gas. Uh, as time went on, we studied these planetary nebulas and we found out that it's not actually a planet inside, it is the dying core of a sun-like star. 
So in about 5 billion years, this is what our sun's going to look like. So uh, the death of a sun-like star or a low mass or average mass star, we get what is called a planetary nebula. So that star will live for billions of years, uh, fusing all of the gas in its core, that hydrogen gas through thermonuclear fusion. We're getting uh, helium and lighter gases and lighter elements that we see on the periodic table through the star's life. Uh, once it gets to a point where it can no longer fuse any more fuel or we run out of fuel, uh, that star will start expanding, trying to like fuse any last uh, elements that it can. Uh, however, when there's literally nothing else for it to fuse, that star will explode or that star will die. And that core of that star will expel out all of those gases and all of that stuff that that star has created throughout its lifetime. Uh, so <clears throat> with something like the Ring Nebula, we have lighter elements like oxygen and helium and nitrogen and that sort of thing. And those different colors are uh, different elements that we see in our periodic table. So why don't we jump on over to, was it the Crescent Nebula? <clears throat> Now, the word nebula can also kind of be a bit misleading because we've got a nebula, which is a big old star forming region. We have a nebula, uh, which is uh, the death of the star. Uh, what a nebula is in space, a nebula is just a big uh, cloud of gas. Now, uh, what we're seeing on the screen here is a live view of what's going on at our Giovanni Open Deck Observatory. So our 14 inch telescope is currently pointing uh, at these objects and uh, we're able to adjust them and take long exposures. Um, so if we were to look at these, some of these objects with our naked eye, we might not be able to uh, see them as bright or as colorful uh, versus with these, uh, viewing them with these long exposures. Uh, so this guy specifically, uh, we are looking at a 20 second exposure, uh, meaning we're taking a picture every second for 20 seconds and compiling that into one uh, really uh, bright or really detailed picture depending on the object. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, the Crescent Nebula, uh, was formed by a really fast stellar wind from a wolf Rayet star. Uh, so what happened was that stellar wind, uh, collided with and energized the slower moving wind ejected by the star when it became a red giant, uh, around between 250,000 to 400,000 years ago. So a red giant star, uh, is a star that's, uh, a heavier star, so a more massive star, uh, so like multiple solar mass star that's nearing the end of its lifetime. Uh, so red giant stars will appear very big and very red uh, in the sky. So the Crescent Nebula uh, was that red giant star about 400,000 years ago. Uh, and the result of these winds uh, colliding is a shell and two shock waves. So in this image here, we see one shock wave moving outward and one shock wave, one shock wave moving inward. Uh, the inward moving shock uh, heats the stellar wind to X-ray emitting temperatures. That means very, very hot and very, very energetic uh, temperatures. So uh, I see that there was a request for Dumbbell by Annie Glazy, and I believe we can jump on over to him. So the Dumbbell Nebula uh, is another one of my favorite planetary nebulas. It's also known as the Apple Core Nebula. So uh, we saw the Ring Nebula a second ago. Uh, and so we saw that circle. Uh, you'll see these like, streaks going across the, the screen here. What we're doing is since we're in the middle of taking a long exposure, we're moving the telescope as we're taking a picture. So it looks like we're going light speed towards the next object. It's just that we're kind of uh, smudging through uh, <laughs> the sky for a second. But uh, the Dumbbell Nebula is the same type of object as the Ring Nebula. However, you'll see it will it looks a bit different. So uh, we can still see, what a great night out. Wow, this stuff is so clear. <laughs> this looks awesome. Uh, so right in the center, uh, we can see that white dwarf star. So we can see the dying core uh, of that star. Uh, and that gas surrounding it is, of course, those elements and those gases that that star has created throughout its lifetime. Um, now, I see that there was a request to see the North American Nebula. However, we can't quite get him tonight. We will need a filter uh, to see him. 
but we can definitely try another time. Um, I also do want to mention that later on in the evening, we will be viewing Mars and we will be talking about Mars and its opposition and exactly what that means. Uh, but until then, we're gonna try to uh, jump around other objects uh, in our sky. So let's try uh, Neptune. Let's jump on over to him. So planets look a little, uh, little neat. They look a little different than deep sky objects do uh, in the uh, plane wave telescopes. Uh, since planets are of course a lot closer to us than these uh, deep sky objects that are thousands of light years away, so Neptune is this nice little little blue dot <laughs> uh, that we see here. So uh, with planets, uh, we actually don't take long exposures or like those like 20 second exposures. Uh, what we're doing is we're taking, it's like video mode. So instead of like tens of seconds of exposure, we're taking a couple milliseconds of exposure. Uh, the reason why we're getting this kind of like fuzz or movement in the screen is just because of atmospheric turbulence. Uh, so it'll look like it's kind of like shining or, or moving underwater. Uh, Neptune is the furthest of our ice giants. It's actually the furthest planet in our solar system since Pluto is technically not an official planet, but that's okay. Um, uh, Neptune was actually last visited by, I believe, Voyager 2 back in the 80s. And I think that's like one of the coolest things because those really high definition pictures that we see, like, you know, if you're like, a nerd and you look at pictures of planets because like I do that, I don't know. Um, those really high defini uh, definition uh, definition pictures that we see of Neptune um, are taken by Voyager. So we are one and only and last flyby, our, our last flyby of Neptune was in the 80s. We haven't had a flyby since. So he's been kind of lonely for a couple decades. So you'll see that bright blue dot in the center and then uh, that star is Triton. So that star, I believe, just to the left of Neptune, or what looks like a star, that really bright dot uh, right next to Neptune is one of his. Now, I see that we have a request to see the Andromeda galaxy. So we can probably jump on over to her. <laughs> uh, Andromeda is one of the coolest galaxies. I don't know, I think I'm saying that for everything, but I think everything is cool. I'm biased, but that's besides the point. Anyways, uh, Andromeda is about 2.5 million light years away from us, meaning uh, we can actually see Andromeda in the sky with our naked eye if we're in like a, a deep sky, or sorry, a dark sky area like Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, but uh, Andromeda with your naked eye, about two and a half million light years away. Uh, <clears throat> and Andromeda is, blue shifted to us, meaning Andromeda is coming towards us uh, pretty, pretty uh, fast. <laughs> uh, fast as in like in a couple billion years, uh, the Milky Way and Andromeda will become one galaxy, either cleverly named Andromeda Way or Milk Dromeda. I was not on that committee. I will also not be there when it collides, so I have no say in what they call it. But <laughs> besides that, uh, it'll be cool. It'll be a real neat light show. Uh, there won't any be, there won't really be any like stars smashing into each other or like planets smashing into each other since all of this stuff is so many millions and billions of miles away and light years apart from each other. Uh, all that's happening is we've got two black holes kind of like uh, coming real close to each other and they're going to try to orbit each other. So the Milky Way's black hole and Andromeda's black hole are just going to kind of get real close and become a super big galaxy. So viewing uh, Andromeda, or yeah, the Andromeda galaxy, that really bright core there is the center of that galaxy. Uh, so that's where that supermassive black hole holding that galaxy is. Uh, you can also see those darker stripes kind of going through uh, that frame there. Those are those star forming regions or uh, nebulas, those gas cloud uh, regions. So Andromeda is a, a younger galaxy with star forming still happening um, and that sort of thing going on there. Now, uh, I see that we want to see Cassiopeia. However, Cassiopeia is a constellation, and the area of sky that we're looking at with this telescope is a very, very small area. Uh, Cassiopeia takes up a larger area of space, so we can see Cassiopeia with our naked eye, but uh, zooming in on Cassiopeia um, with the telescope, uh, we won't really be able to see the, the entire constellation. We'll just see little smudges, so we'll actually, or little, you know, deep sky bits if there are any in there. Uh, now let's see, 
Uranus. Yeah. So let's jump on over to Uranus. So Uranus is one of the two ice giants uh, in our solar system. So we looked at Neptune a second ago. I believe Neptune looks a little more teal, like kind of lighter teal than Uranus. I think Uranus looks like a little bit of a darker blue. Might be a bit difficult to tell um, on this uh, video feed, but he still, uh, his luminosity is very different than the stars in the uh, field. So, uh, nice, nice little guy there. So yeah, Uranus is again, one of our ice giants that are called ice giants uh, because they are gaseous like um, Saturn and Jupiter. However, they have more icy gases like ammonia ices and that sort of thing uh, in their atmosphere. So they appear more blue in the sky. Uh, these ice giants are really cool as well because we actually think uh, because of their carbon content and just the general chemical composition of these planets, as you get closer and closer to the core, it gets so, so, so dense that we think that we can form like diamond oceans and diamond bergs uh, in these ice giants. So if you like really want some diamonds or something, you can go fly through this planet with naturally occurring supersonic wind speeds. Uh, it, this planet would actually blow the skin off of your body, <laughs> but like if you really want some diamonds, like you could, <laughs> you could hang out there. Um, the North Star, uh, I would love to see, however, uh, he is hiding behind the <laughs> building. Uh, he's right behind the uh, garage uh, of the Open Deck Observatory. So we can see him with our naked eye, but not quite with the telescope. Uh, now we could try the owl cluster in Cassiopeia. Yeah, so we can't exactly, we can see the owl cluster. Uh, we just can't see the entire constellation of Cassiopeia. Uh, the owl cluster, uh, I think he looks kind of funny. Uh, he, he supposedly looks like an owl. Uh, I, he's also known, I believe, as the dragonfly cluster. Uh, now, um, what you'll see, nice. So those two bright stars off to the left, those are the eyes of the owl. We have the body going down and the wings kind of going out like that. <laughs> and the two, the little owl tail or the two little owl feet. Uh, nice. Ooh, that looks good. I like that. Um, those two little owl feet kind of in the, in the middle of the frame there. If you squint, you can see an owl or, ah, perfect. Nice. <laughs> Uh, if you squint, you can see an owl or a little dragonfly. Uh, I think he looks like E.T., but that's just me. Um, now, let's see. Um, M81 and M82 have set. Ooh, that's actually really quick. Um, the owl cluster is an open cluster. So open clusters are different than globular star clusters. Globulars will have hundreds of thousands of stars all bound together by gravity. Uh, but open clusters... Uh, they'll have a weak gravitational pull. So they're formed from that nebula. They're formed from that uh, giant cloud of gas. Uh, but these stars form like kind of far enough away from each other to where they slowly drift apart from each other because of a weak gravitational pull. So they're called open clusters because it's kind of like the clusters opening up versus a uh, globular star cluster where all of those stars are globbed together. Um, now, let's see. Um, the Draco constellation uh, is a constellation in the sky. So these uh, seeing a constellation, the area of sky, again, that we're looking at through the telescope is very small, so we can't quite grab uh, the entire constellation. Uh, but he is up. Um, let's see. Uh, the, can, we, can we see Jupiter right now? Um, Let's see, let's jump on over to Jupiter. I think he's low in the sky, so he might look a little, little fuzzier, um, but we still should be able to see him. So we're gonna jump over to video mode, just like how we did with um, Uranus and Neptune. And oh, we can see the Galilee, oh, all four, all four of the Galilean moons, nice. So uh, right in the center, that real bright guy, uh, I think we, we, if we put, down, actually, hold on. So yeah, right in the center is Jupiter and then those, uh, the one bright dot on the top and then the three on the bottom are the four largest moons of Jupiter. So uh, I don't know exactly, they're Zeus's lady friends, Io and uh, Ganymede, Zeus's lady friends. Um, and I think if we down the exposure time a little bit, we can maybe get the stripes on Jupiter, just barely. So those stripes on Jupiter, nice, little guys. 
um, are uh, different elements that we see uh, in Jupiter's atmosphere. So we're seeing hydrogen clouds uh, and like uh, helium clouds and those different, um, those darker stripes basically are like the hydrogen clouds that aren't covered uh, by the helium sunscreen. So those darker stripes on Jupiter are basically like Jupiter's tan lines. Um, now, uh, while we're on the topic of planets, real quick, I do want to mention that in a couple minutes, we will be talking about Mars and viewing Mars. Uh, so if you have any last minute requests, uh, make sure to get those guys in. Now, I see Tom Daniel requested Sirius. I'd love to look at Sirius. He's really, really cool. But he is a winter star. It's the brightest star in our sky. Uh, but we cannot grab him uh, tonight. Uh, maybe in like a couple months, we'll be able to, we will, we'll be able to see him. Uh, the large Magellanic Cloud, uh, both the Magellanic Clouds, we can't see. We are too far north. Uh, we can only really see those guys in the southern hemisphere. Um, uh, sorry, Sirius, we'll be able to see in like two or three hours, uh, but he'll be like high in the sky around this time in a couple, in a few months. Now, uh, bright star we could grab. Um, we can try Vega. So Zach Davis requested a bright star. Uh, Vega, I believe, is the fifth or the sixth brightest star in the sky, so almost as bright as Sirius. <laughs> and uh, Vega is a, the brightest star in the constellation Lyra, the Lyre. So earlier we looked at the Ring Nebula, uh, which is in the constellation Lyra. Uh, and yeah, Vega is a very, very bright star. Uh, the reason why we see those kind of crosses uh, when we look at really bright objects like stars is actually because of the telescope. So the scope that we're using, there's a large primary mirror at the base, that 14 inch mirror, and then a smaller secondary middle mirror, uh, kind of in the middle of the telescope. And that secondary mirror is smaller than the primary and it's kind of held in the middle uh, with this cross sort of shape. So why we're seeing these crosses uh, through this telescope is because, I mean, that's why we're seeing those crosses uh, in the view is because we're just seeing what's holding the, um, the secondary mirror. Uh, now, M17, John Dwyer requested M17. Um, uh, I see there was a request for the Pleiades star cluster after, but he will be a little too low by the time of the interactive stargazing ends, uh, but you may be able to see him, uh, rising in the eastern horizon, uh, in a little bit. Now, let's see. M17, is he a, what is he? Um, the Swan Nebula, whoa, that looks sick. Oh my goodness, <gasps> wow, okay. So, <laughs> sorry, this is a, uh, another star forming region, so a nebula, and this is called the Swan Nebula. So M17, again, the 17th object cataloged um, in the Messier catalog. Uh, the swan's kind of flipped upside down right now, uh, but you can see there's the body of the swan sort of in the middle and the head is sort of looking uh, down into the bottom right uh, of the screen. Uh, so again, this nebula has enough mass to form tens of thousands of sun-like stars, uh, and it will be uh, luminous until uh, all of those stars are formed and no more gas can show. Uh, <laughs> very cute, very cute little feet. Um, but uh, the reason why that gas is lit up is because of the uh, protostars, those baby stars inside of that gas. Uh, and I believe actually, kind of like in the middle of the screen, that's a dark nebula, which means that there's gas uh, in front of those, there's a very thick cloud of gas in front of those stars being born. So it looks like a kind of a dark area of sky or like there's nothing there, uh, but it's just that there's a lot of gas there. Uh, the program we're using for uh, camera control is called Malincam. So this Malincam software is operating our 14-inch um, plane wave telescope. Uh, M33, I see, is a request. Um, now... I think we're gonna try Saturn and the Sombrero Galaxy right after this, just to get two little good guys in before uh, we jump on over to talking about Mars. Um, M33, we're gonna jump on over to, which I believe is the Pinwheel Galaxy. <clears throat> and we're setting our exposure time to 13 seconds. 
uh, we're jumping on over to this object. Um, we might be able to see the arms in the galaxy. Okay, nice. Yeah, just barely. So that's uh, center there, that core, uh, M33 is a little further away than uh, Andromeda was. Uh, so we uh, don't see a like a core as bright as Andromeda, but we can still see that core. We can also see those uh, spiral arms. So the spiral arms are where star forming is happening. Uh, star forming regions are. Um, so let is, let's try Saturn really fast. Let's jump on over to that guy. So Saturn, we'll be able to see the rings of Saturn. Um, might be able to grab a moon. Um, he's low in the horizon, just like Jupiter was. And nice, okay. Yeah, so just barely, those tiny little dots right next to him. Yeah, cool. So those three dots right next to Saturn are uh, some of Saturn's uh, brightest moons. So Titan's probably in there. Uh, and then if we lower the exposure a little bit, we'll be able to see the center of Saturn. He looks like a little bug to me. I think he looks so cute. Uh, and then we can see those rings around Saturn made primarily of space rock and water ice. Um, now uh, we uh, are running out of time a little bit. So we're gonna end on Saturn here. Uh, I'm really sorry for those requests that, that just came in. Uh, we have to jump on over to talking about Mars. So uh, we're gonna switch on over to Mars right now, actually. Uh, and then we're talk gonna talk about him a little uh, in more in depth uh, a little bit. Uh, and if you didn't, if we didn't get to see, or if we didn't get to any of your requests uh, this week, you can definitely tune in next week and we can uh, try to get them in there. Um, so this month is where Mars is out of position, if you didn't know, and that means that it's, it'll be a really close approach to Earth and won't be close again for another 15 years or so, or won't be this close again for another 15 years or so. It's not going to be as bright as a full moon. Uh, a lot of people say that. I like see that all over for some reason, uh, but it will be uh, very brighter than it uh, has been. Uh, so Mars looks really red in the sky with your naked eye and through telescope aid, you can see it has a very red surface. We can see that that uh, Maria on its surface. And Mars is the reason why this observatory was founded over 125 years ago. Now, uh, we will be passing the spotlight on over to Bill Sheehan to begin our Mars opposition portion of the stream. Uh, thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. And uh, we'll see you again uh, later, I guess. <laughs> All right. Well, hello. Are we on? Okay. I can. Uh, so I can hear you. Okay. So we're live. So um, Mars is, of course, the highlight of the evening for many of us. Uh, partly because it's looming in the sky brighter than it has been since 2003 and brighter than it will be again in 15 years. So it's really a good chance to see this wonderful planet. And uh, as Ariel just mentioned, this is a planet that has a particular role in terms of the history of the Lowell Observatory. The observatory only exists because of Mars. And we're going to have a chance shortly, as soon as uh, we get our technology going uh, forward, uh, to look at Mars at this very good uh, opportunity through a storied telescope, the Clark Refractor that Percival Lowell set up here in 1896. Uh, so, so this is really a wonderful opportunity to see Mars as uh, perhaps many of us will never have a chance to see it again. Uh, I'm joined tonight uh, by uh, Klaus Brasch, and uh, I should mention that the two of us together have quite a lot of experience you know, looking at Mars. The first time I looked at Mars was in 1965, and Klaus, when was the first time that you looked at Mars? 1956. I'm not sure how many years of uh, observing experience that gives us, uh, but it's quite a lot. 
Yes, it is. 1965 was was an important year, not because of what I happened to see through a telescope, but because that was the year that Mariner 4, the first spacecraft uh, to successfully image Mars at close range passed by the planet. And it revealed a world of pretty stark topography, a lot of craters. It looked a little bit like a faraway moon. And for a while, uh, scientists were somewhat disinclined to put a lot of effort into studying it. Why go so far afield to see a planet uh, that never gets closer than 140 times the distance of the moon, and yet uh, turns out perhaps to be just another moon? Well, what, what do we actually know about Mars now, Klaus? Is it just another moon, or is it more interesting than that? Oh, I think it's a slight bit interesting, <laughs> a lot more interesting. And in fact, as a biologist, I can't wait for us to send probes there to see if there's any life left on it. Well, and we do have a couple of probes on the way, including our own Perseverance, uh, which is... Exactly, exactly. It's early next year. So, so uh, we're looking at the dome of the Clark Refractor, which is a telescope that uh, Percival Lowell acquired uh, for the sum of $20,000. Dollar was worth a lot more in those days, obviously. And this was the pioneering telescope in the southwestern United States where he came to try to get very good seeing conditions. And uh, there's an image on the right that shows the Clark uh, recently refurbished and brought back to its original uh, pristine beauty. Uh, and, and it's a great telescope for planetary observing if, if the seeing, seeing is good. Uh, so we'll have to see what, uh, what the seeing is like here in, in uh, a few moments. Uh, is there any way we can get the uh, view of Mars in, in the Clark at this point? Hmm. Oh, okay, got it. Um, we're, we're waiting for that image and waiting, needless to say, with great anticipation. Uh, so uh, in the meantime, let me mention that Mars is a glorious site on these uh, evenings, even if you don't have a telescope. Um, there, there are very few red objects in the sky. There, there are a few stars that are red. One is uh, Betelgeuse, which uh, dimmed unexpectedly last year. Uh, Antares, the rival of Mars. Aries was the Greek uh, name for Mars, uh, which is another reddish object. But Mars is, is by far uh, the most impressive red object in the sky and red is a color that has a lot of effects on our, us emotionally. Um, it, it's a both a sign uh, of our desire, but also a sign of warning. So uh, it really uh, alerts us to pay attention when we see a reddish object in nature. Uh, and uh, the other thing about Mars is that it has very erratic movements. Uh, it seems like a bit of a manic depressive planet. Uh, because it will brighten up as it is now uh, to become one of the most uh, vivid objects in the sky. And then it will essentially taper off to become a little more than an obscure glowworm. Uh, so the ancient uh, astronomers who uh, studied the sky, mainly thinking that they were interpreters of the gods and that uh, by understanding their movements, uh, information could be uh, divulged about the time to plant crops or uh, when it was a good time to fight a war against the neighboring tribes, when to hold an election. Uh, so uh, the, the ancients actually uh, paid quite a bit of attention to Mars because of these erratic movements. And Klaus, do you, do you have that picture showing? Well, just a minute. If I might just add two things before we leave this slide. Uh, you may notice the name of this telescope is Clark. That was the optical company that made it, and it made some of the best telescopes in the world at the time. And I'd also like you on a lighter note to notice the inside of the dome is made of wood, as is everything else. And here you see a couple, a number, a three of the wheels, which are actually rubber tires uh, that actually rotate the dome around. And one of the stories is that these are 1950 something 
forward truck tires, and they were installed because they're much quieter than the original, very noisy steel wheels. And also one thing I'd like to mention, the reason Mars is called Mars, or Ares in Greek, it refers to the Greco-Roman god of war because of its ruddy color. So that's uh, sort of a bit more of the mythology added on. Okay, on the next slide now, go go for it, Bill. Right. Uh, so so it was the god of war, uh, and also though it was named for uh, a god of uh, the harvest because Mars's color varies from being deep blood red uh, to kind of wheat colored, and uh, you'll notice if you look out tonight at Mars. Uh, from wherever you are, that it is quite uh, deep red at the moment. And uh, the reason for that is there isn't very much dust in the atmosphere of Mars. Uh, Mars gets quite yellowish uh, or golden when there's a lot of dust in its atmosphere. And sometimes the whole planet is obscured in terms of its surface uh, because of these large dust storms. And uh, so uh, that means because it is so red, uh, that we have a good chance, as we'll see, of seeing the surface detail on Mars. Uh, and uh, here, here is a diagram that basically shows uh, the strange loop-the-loop -loop, uh, motion that Mars makes uh, when it kind of uh, comes to the point where it's opposite the sun in the sky. And uh, as you'll see in this uh, diagram, uh, when Mars is opposite the sun, it's also on the other side of the Earth's orbit from the sun, and therefore the distance between the two planets reaches its minimum. Uh, and uh, it, we're right now, I think, seeing Mars at about, what, 38 million uh, miles or so away? That's right, that's right. Wow. And this, this diagram here, this animation shows it every two years we pass by Mars close up. And one, one of the reasons why we have uh, a uh, spacecraft headed towards Mars is because the times when Mars and, and the Earth are uh, about to line up are also the best times to launch spacecraft because it uh, basically minimizes the amount of fuel that's needed to get the, the uh, space spacecraft into the right position to, to uh, rendezvous with Mars. Uh, so, so anyway, uh, there was a similar kind of uh, event in 1894, uh, Percival Lowell, who was the founder of the observatory and a very wealthy, uh, but somewhat um, uh, independent-minded Boston Brahmin, as they were called, a member of the elite class in Boston, uh, got very interested in Mars after he returned from his last uh, voyage to the Far East. And he was interested because recently some observations had been made by an Italian astronomer named Giovanni Schiaparelli. Uh, some of you may know the name from Schiaparelli, who was a famous fashion designer and who actually was his niece. Uh, but anyway, he looked at Mars through a telescope in Milan and he introduced a new fashion for observing and drawing the planet. Uh, Klaus, can we move to that one that shows the, some of the drawings? So Mars has had many different uh, visages over the years. It's uh, showed many faces. And uh, I want to first direct you to the one on the, le on the left. Uh, this is a drawing of Mars. Percival Lowell called it the first drawing of Mars worthy of the name. It was made by Christian Huygens, who's a Dutch astronomer in 1659 with a telescope that was uh, quite a bit more modest than the Clark. Uh, but basically, in those days, they had very long tubes to their telescopes uh, because the lenses weren't uh, optically very good. And he stuck it out of the attic uh, window of his father's house in The Hague in Holland, and he made out this dark marking, uh, which uh, you'll see in, in these other images um, in, in better detail. Uh, the one in the middle is uh, made by probably the most gifted astronomical artist to ever observe the planets, uh, E.M. Antoniadi, uh, and it's just unbelievably beautiful. And then the other is a, a, a photographic image taken by Earl Slipher, another Lowell astronomer 
1941, which was another opposition somewhat like the one that we're experiencing now. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Anyway, as I mentioned, uh, Schiaparelli uh, in Milan uh, drew Mars, and Schiaparelli was an interesting guy. He was a very well-trained professional astronomer. Uh, he was trained in the classical astronomy of the day, which involved uh, making very precise measurements of double stars with a device called a micrometer, uh, making calculations and uh, that sort of work. Uh, and he also was colorblind, and he only had one good eye uh, between the two. Uh, and so with this somewhat unusual dis disposition, Schiaparelli put his eye to the telescope in Milan with the intention of making a very accurate map. So what he was interested in more than anything else was getting precise positions of the features on Mars so that he could transcribe them onto a, a map. So it was the first carefully measured map of Mars ever made. Uh, perhaps because he was looking at Mars with a very precise eye, uh, or perhaps because his training uh, tended more towards surveying and uh, the kind of work that a draftsman might do, uh, he uh, ended up finding out all these very small thin slender lines uh, crisscrossing the planet, which he called canali, uh, a word which in Italian, Noah Klaus speaks Italian. What does canali mean? Channels. Just simply means channels. Right, and I think it can even mean grooves or stripes. Yeah. Uh, so, so it was a non-specific uh, term, but there was a lot of interest in uh, man-made or human-made uh, channels at the time. What was going on with regard to that clause at the time? Well, it, at the turn of the century, basically, uh, of the uh, uh, 19th century, uh, canals were the newest high tech. Uh, there were several thousand kilometers worth of canals dug in Britain alone. And these were used instead of uh, horse and buggies, they were used by ships to transport materials into various places. Also, at that time, the Suez Canal uh, it was being planned, which was a major, major undertaking, and the Panama Canal. And in addition, um, when Percival Lowell arrived in Arizona, Arizona, of course, was and still is desert. And in those days, a desert was considered to be more or less of a wasteland. And so Lowell and many of the people, uh, contemporaries who lived here at the time, decided that in order to make Arizona a more useful place, they should start building canals and irrigate everything uh, in order to be able to have agriculture. So canals were a big, big deal in, in those days. They, they, and that in part probably explains the fascination with the whole concept of canals that both right. Lowell reported and, and, and as you can see in these sketches. Well, and, and President Lowell had a particular connection with canals because his great fortune uh, came from the textile industry of New England. The Lowell family uh, were perhaps the wealthiest capitalist family of, of their day. And, uh, and basically, they, they uh, set up textile mills in places like Lowell and Lawrence, uh, Massachusetts. And there is actually, if you ever have a chance to go uh, back out that way in Lowell, a national historical park uh, built around the textile uh, factories that uh, Lowell's uh, family had set up there. And there are, uh, I think, something like six miles of canals. Essentially, what they did was they dammed up the Merrimack River uh, to make, uh, take advantage of the hydraulic power uh, to turn the, the wheels of the mill uh, so that essentially that was what uh, uh, provided the power to spin all of this cotton, which was grown, of course, in in the southern states at the time, this was before the Civil Civil War, into uh, cloth. And this cloth was then exported uh, to, to places like England. So um, the Percival Lowell's own fortune, as it were, was built on these waterways of canals. And another thing that was going on at this time, and we're, we're basically just sort of in a holding pattern until Mars comes into view, so we're not just like trying to be overly garrulous here. Uh, but 
uh, one of the things uh, also that came about at this time was Darwin's theory of evolution. And uh, it was also uh, spun off uh, some side theories like that of Herbert Spencer, a famous British philosopher, who suggested that there was a natural progression of things uh, from so sort of homogeneity, like in a nebula, uh, towards more complexity, and then finally things ran down back into homogeneity again. And so the idea was a planet uh, ran a specific course of evolution based on how massive it was. And Mars being smaller than the Earth was supposed to have quickly gone through its evolutionary career, uh, lost much of its atmosphere, uh, lost its... Um, uh, water, and uh, therefore it was a dying planet uh, that presumably if it had intelligent beings uh, would have needed to uh, produce engineering works in order to uh, to survive. So um, there, there's, there's a real uh, chance now for us to actually turn our gaze from uh, these charts that influence people like Lowell to the actual image of Mars, which we now have in the Clark Telescope. We're hoping to see that. Do we have it? Um, I think I think we've been notified that it should be coming in now. Okay, so I should stop share. Okay. Um, so so someone has asked a question. Um, oh, okay. It's on YouTube. Uh, I believe Ray Bradbury was strongly influenced by the idea of canals uh, when he wrote the Martian Chronicles? Was he influenced uh, by Lowell's writings? Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, he, he was, uh, as everyone was, uh, influenced by Lowell's writings. Uh, first person probably that was influenced was H.G. Wells, Edgar Rice Burroughs, and Ray Bradbury, who does indeed have, have uh, canals in his, his book, The Martian Chronicles. The first person, a science fiction writer that didn't include Lowellian canals in his writings was Arthur C. Clarke in The Sands of Mars in 1950. Uh, but before that, everyone was captivated by Lowell's ideas. So we're looking, we should be seeing the image. No, we're not, I'm not seeing it. I may not be able to show it to us. It's 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 on the YouTube. I'm, I'm not seeing it on the YouTube. Okay, well, I'm not seeing it. Yeah. Okay, so. Apparently it's on YouTube, Bill. We're just not seeing it. Okay. So, uh, well, I, I guess I'm. You won't see the image in Ring Central. That we were on YouTube. Message, Bill, message from Danielle. We won't see it. Okay. But the other folks can see it. Well, I'm just guessing that what we're seeing is probably. Um, some, some of the same detail that was uh, visible with the 14 inch. Uh, yes. And as I recall, uh, the same, the, the third major areas was in view, uh, the polar cap, uh, the south polar cap, cap which is now dwindled uh, because we're, we're late in the Martian season. So that had once been a vast expanse of uh, mixed mixture of uh, water ice and carbon uh, dioxide, frozen carbon dioxide, uh, and uh, a lot of the, uh, as we passed the the uh, summer solstice, which was at the end of August, uh, a lot of that carbon dioxide has sublimated away, and uh, what we're left now is just with a very, um, oh, I've got, I've got an image now, uh, yeah, very, very, um, 
tiny. I, I, I can barely see the uh, polar cap, but it's definitely there. Um, and, um, and that triangular area that is projecting downward, that is the area, uh, it used to be called the Hourglass Sea. Uh, it's now called the Certus Major. Uh, and uh, these names were all, uh, that we use today were all introduced on the map by Schiaparelli. And, and what he wanted to do was he wanted to uh, give names uh, that weren't too chauvinistic, that weren't just, um, you know, British astronomers or French astronomers or uh, that sort of thing, because that would inspire too much international rivalry. And, and of course, that was a time when imperial rivalries were you know, at, at their height. Um, and so instead, he basically uh, shrouded the planet in all of these uh, very evocative names uh, from Greek mythology, uh, the um, geography of the ancient world, the Mediterranean world, and uh, the Bible. And so we have Hellas, which was the name for Greece. Uh, we have Certus Major. Uh, Certus was um, a, a bay that was, I think, somewhere like near the Persian Gulf or something. Uh, and uh, they're, they're very evocative names. And uh, so we still use them today. Um, we're, we're getting a pretty good image actually through the Clark. Good. It's, it's wavering a little bit. And, and one of the things to point out is that, um, you know, when, when people look at some of these, these drawings, If, uh, when people um, look at these drawings, they, they tend to think that it's it's um, they, they tend to think that the astronomers were in, in the position of someone uh, drawing a uh, still life, you know, like a pot of flowers or something like that. And the reality is, uh, we're viewing Mars through the ocean of the atmosphere, and and so it's always quivering more or less. And so some of the fine detail only comes out in very short flashes. And uh, not, nowadays with um, you know, special imaging techniques like uh, charged couple devices, we're able to capture some of that detail, freeze it. But people that only had their eyes essentially uh, only saw things in glimpses. And that, that in part explains why people like Percival Lowell saw these canals. But if you just look at these uh, large dark areas, um, you're, you're basically seeing a, a very uh, visually appealing uh, Mars. This, this is probably the most famous uh, part of the planet. And uh, what we're seeing, we're seeing the Certus Major, which is the most prominent dark area. Uh, then then uh, as I'm looking at this image, uh, there's a curving a uh, dark area towards the upper part of the disk. And that is called Sinus Sabaeus. Uh, there, there's another tiny little um, dark feature that's just kind of at the limb of the planet, just, just out of view, uh, which is the central meridian of Mars. That's basically uh, known as Sinus Meridiani, uh, which is, is basically how uh, the various longitudes on Mars are uh, computed. You can see the polar cap. There's a brightish area just above the uh, Certus Major complex towards where the pole is, uh, and that's Hellas. Uh, so someone is asking if we'll be able to see the uh, Phobos and, and Deimos, Mars's moons. And uh, if, if uh, it were possible to set the exposure long enough, we could certainly see them. If you were looking through the Clark visually, you'd be able to image them. Uh, I'm not sure, Daniel, whether we're able to actually image them with the uh, technology that we have. Well, if I might interject, um, Phobos and Deimos are very small moons and they're very faint. And if they're anywhere close to Mars itself, then the brightness of Mars will blot them out. I've seen one of the moons many years ago when it was at its furthest from the planet, but it just looks like a tiny, dim little star. 
So, uh, and, and Mars currently is in a fairly star-rich region, so unless you know exactly from the ephemerides of, of the two satellites where to look, it's unlikely that we'll be able to see them, positively identify them. Okay, and also right now, Mars is very low in the sky, which means we're looking through a lot of atmosphere, and therefore the twinkling effect, or seeing as astronomers call it, it's really very extreme, and as Bill said, it's like looking through an ocean of air. Uh, and so, anyway, it's highly unlikely that you would be able to see them. Right. Although amazingly, they were discovered uh, as early as 1877 by Asaph Hall, who, who was an astronomer at the U.S. Naval Observatory. And uh, at the time, that observatory, that telescope, was the largest refractor in the world. It was a 26-inch. So it was a couple inches larger even than the Clark, but it was in a hor horrific location. It was at Foggy Bottom in Washington, D.C. And uh, so Hall, Hall was uh, an exceptional astronomer to be able to detect the two moons visually. And uh, Phobos and Deimos were named for the, uh, basically the, the sun of Mars. Uh, and uh, so they had have uh, great names. And they were named actually uh, at the suggestion of a, uh, the master of Eton College, whose, um, I think it was his, her, his, his uh, great niece uh, who uh, suggested the name Pluto uh, for a planet that also was, uh, um, that has a, a history associated with Lowell Observatory. So this particular family seemed to specialize in naming these things. And Phobos and Deimos were, were not the last, but almost the last uh, satellites that were discovered visually rather than photographically. Uh, the very last one was Amalthea, uh, the fifth satellite of Jupiter, which was discovered in 1892 by Edward Emerson Barnard at the Lick Observatory. We'll just let you kind of drink in a little bit of Mars there. And uh, Actually, a very nice view. Um, so, so as you're watching this view, uh, so some people may be encouraged, and I'd like to encourage them. Oh, someone, someone's asking, is there a snow cl uh, cap at eight o'clock? Yes, there is. It's a very tiny little uh, whitish, al almost dot size, but yeah, that's the South Polar Cap, and that's definitely uh, close to its minimum uh, size at this point. Bill, you might also mention that uh, in, in, on some occasions, I'm not sure tonight, but if you see other bright regions at the edge of the disk, those can be clouds on Mars or haze uh, as well, early morning or late evening haze. Uh, so uh, Mars has weather, uh, nothing like what we have, but it does have an atmosphere and occasionally clouds will appear over high elevation mountain peaks, for example, and sometimes you can see them. Yeah, well, that's a good point. And uh, some, some of the mountains are, I mean, they're shield volcanoes, which are much uh, taller than any uh, on Earth. The uh, tallest uh, volcanoes uh, are the Hawaiian uh, volcanoes. And uh, on Mars, there's uh, there are shield volcanoes. They're not in the view of the telescope that we have right now. Uh, but one called Olympus Mons uh, is 78,000 feet above the Mars datum, which is basically the average elevation of uh, topography on Mars. Since it doesn't have oceans, there isn't any sea level as such, but there is a sea level equivalent. And, uh, and over these clouds, or over these uh, tall shield volcanoes, one can actually uh, see forming uh, clouds of ice crystals, orographic clouds, similar to the ones that form over the San Francisco uh, peaks on a, on a summer afternoon. So, um, so there are ice crystal clouds on Mars, and then there are also these vast dust storms uh, that uh, can be very local in, in uh, distribution, just covering a small part of the planet. Essentially, they're dust devils that get out of hand. And uh, Mars is such where some of these things can grow to enormous size. And we have seen, uh, in, in fact, in 2018, uh, when Mars was a little bit closer to the Earth, uh, we were completely wiped out for uh, viewing Mars because the whole planet was 
essentially just totally shrouded in dust uh, for, for uh, a long period of time. So uh, even in the Clark telescope, having good seeing like we're having tonight, essentially it was, it was just about as featureless as an orange. Uh, it was viewed through, um, you know, an opera glass or something. We had a question earlier about what the clouds are made of, and I think Bill alluded to it already. They're water ice crystals. Um, somebody also asked if there really is water on Mars. Currently, liquid water, as we understand it, is not possible on the surface of Mars uh, because it's simply the atmosphere is too thin. And so any water that might seep up to the surface would very quickly sublimate into gas. However, that doesn't preclude there being water deposits at lower depths inside of Mars. And in fact, recent radar uh, uh, studies have suggested that there might be some subterranean lakes uh, several hundred feet below the surface. And from an astrobiological standpoint, that is very, very exciting because as we now know, during the early stages of, the Mar of Mars' formation, uh, this is uh, uh, very likely that Mars had a denser atmosphere and also that it was covered with considerable amounts of liquid water. And we still see evidence of that in many places that there once were lakes and streams and so forth. So that's another reason why I think NASA and others are so interested in going to Mars and in fact really being able to uh, dig uh, below the surface to see if we can find any evidence of microbial or other type of life. Um, and uh, I, I just got information from Danielle, who's at the telescope. Uh, they basically just stopped down the aperture. In other words, they used an iris diaphragm to uh, make the lens instead of 24 inches, uh, 12 inches. And uh, any experienced observer, including Percival Lowell and his associates, uh, quickly found out that the uh, aperture really has to be matched to the seeing. It's very rare that uh, one one gets seeing steady enough uh, to be able to see Mars with a full, well with the full aperture. And generally, a smaller aperture gives a better view. And right now, you're getting really nice views of Mars. Uh, and uh, some of you out there might want to um try sketching some of the features on mars which of course uh, was what the early observers did uh, and uh i'm gonna turn the next question over to you klaus is is terraforming yeah, i saw it i saw it yeah the the term terraforming uh for those uh, uh who know about it but those who don't simply me is is a term that would apply to Let's say we did land on Mars and we had the technology to gradually make the atmosphere of Mars denser by, for example, releasing large amounts of carbon dioxide uh, into it. Uh, then once the atmosphere would get denser, uh, then the possibility of actually having uh, water that is liquid on the surface uh, is a potential uh, Few, very far in the future situation. Arthur C. Clarke, who Bill mentioned earlier, uh, was a very well-known and very serious writer and scientist, and uh, he wrote several books on the concept of terraforming Mars, where we could increase the density of the atmosphere. If we get more carbon dioxide into it, you would have a greenhouse effect, and then the sun would, uh, sunlight would uh, heat up the surface, because now the surface of Mars is deep frozen most of the time. And in other words, gradually kind of change Mars into a more Earth or Terra-like situation. I think that that may be a, a great topic for 100 years from now as a possibility if we're still around on Mars then. But it's not something that could happen very quickly or in any sort of... Uh, single human lifetime because it would be a very slow uh, meteorological and geological process uh, if in fact it turns out to be feasible. Uh, the other thing is we know that you know Mars has a lot of water ice beneath its surface. 
Uh, one of the spacecraft uh, several years ago landed near the South Pole and in fact scratched the sand away and scratched uh, a fair, a several inches uh, below the soil and indeed saw water ice, white uh, ice that very quickly sublimated. So we know Mars has considerable water reserves, only they're frozen at this point. And uh, perhaps uh, then they can be liberated at some point in the future. The good news is if we do go to Mars and start establish colonies, certainly water, shortage of water would not be a problem if we knew how to uh, extract it from the polar caps or the soil and make use of it, which presumably we would at that time. So some exciting possibilities there in the future. Right. Although it's important to, to point out, Mars has always been a planet of illusions. Uh, <clears throat> if if uh, you look at uh, Mars uh, with, the, with the eye through a telescope, uh, you tend to see these darkish areas uh, as being bluish uh, green. I'm not sure if we're looking through a filter right now, uh, but th those are uh, blues that aren't really blue. They're just uh, due to, to um, contrast uh, in, in terms of the way the eye interprets colors that are adjacent to each other, their illusions, in other words, and yet old astronomers thought they were vegetation. And if you, you go out on the Arizona desert, it looks very Mars-like because uh, essentially rust is the reason that Mars looks red. As, as do the cliffs of the Painted Desert. Uh, but it's, it's an extremely cold planet. Um, recent work has suggested that maybe Mars, though it does have a lot of water, uh, doesn't have enough carbon dioxide trapped underneath the surface in order to make the greenhouse warming effect sufficient to bring you know, the atmosphere up to the point where uh, water can flow on the surface. Uh, so, so it's important to point out that terraforming would really be a very difficult enterprise uh, given what we know about Mars. On the other hand, no matter how Earth-like or how much we change Mars uh, in the future, it will never be more hospitable than the most uh, uh, uninhabitable parts of the Earth like Antarctica. So, so you know, the illusion that we could just step out in our uh, shirt sleeves into the Martian environment is really uh, somewhat fanciful. But um, so we better take care of the Earth, in other words, is what I'm saying. <laughs> I agree. Here, here. <laughs> uh, but yeah, beautiful images of Mars. Is anyone out there trying to sketch sketch what they're seeing on the uh, screen? Uh, this, this is a view of Mars that someone like Percival Lowell probably would have given his eye teeth for. Um, and I don't really see on the, in the camera any canal-like uh, visitations, but uh, there, there are features that are somewhat streaky because of the dust blown around the planet. So, um, you know, there are genuinely streaky features uh, that give uh, at least the impression at times that the, there are these canals. Uh, but uh, people have sort of stopped drawing those, I suppose, out of embarrassment now. So they, they just sort of have given up on that trend. There's a lot of detail in Hellas right now. Hellas is that bright area uh, that is kind of towards the pole, polar cap from where Certus Major is pointing. And Hellas itself is actually a somewhat circular area that's a little bit brighter than the background. It's actually a giant impact basin. Uh, early in the solar system, where there are all sorts of debris that was still left over from the uh, formation of the planets and one of these essentially asteroids impacted into Mars and formed this gigantic impact basin and it's actually the largest impact basin known in the solar system uh, and because it's a basin basically uh, it's below the the average elevation of features on Mars and so it tends to fill up with dust uh, and so sometimes it looks really just completely bright full of uh, but right now, there are some interesting detail in there, uh, including there, there's sort of a, a little bit of a faint spot. I think this used to be called in the days of the canals uh, as Zia Lacus uh, and uh, uh, the, the lack of Zia. Another question. Um, 
this is cloud this is me i don't have any thoughts about that trust me I'm just curious. I can't see it here, so I, I'd love to see it. The actual. Uh, oh, there we go. Thank you. I haven't read any of those publications. I think I think we're getting towards the end of our programming. Uh, let me just mention that we're going to be uh, because this is such a special opposition, such a such a. Uh, yeah, I think it. Uh, I I think that, that um, I, I'm not really too sure about the core of Mars. Uh, I think you're right. It may may have a solid iron nickel. Uh, composition. Of course, Mars doesn't have a, a magnetic field, uh, so um, it's certainly not molten. Uh, and I, I think probably that is an, the, the latest idea about uh, what's going on there. Are we still on? I'm not sure. I'm not seeing any images. No. So I'm assuming one of the one of the rovers spirit is at Moose. If that's not working anymore, Our opportunity at Curiosity is near Gale Crater, near near Elysium. Clinician. I'm not sure if anybody is still hearing this. Yeah, neither do I. I think we may have lost them. I think it's just you and me. Well, no, I guess we're still there. I think we're done. Yep. Okay. Are you getting any more messages, Bill? No, no. I, I've got the online meetings, Ring Central, main yeah. screen, um, and and the live broadcast. It looks like the image of Mars. Deb, can you photograph or can you do that? Take a picture of that. Uh, I think I think that's um, that's all, all done. So I think they've just basically cut it off at this point. I presume so. How, how did you think it went, Klaus? Actually